Uh, without further ado, I suggest we move on to the round table. We are running behind, um, and we know the governor can stay a little bit longer, but not much. Uh, so we are going to start directly. I'll give a couple more minutes to John, actually. Uh, he's not going to speak first, but you know, he was interrupted, so that would be nice to have John uh, spend a couple more minutes, but we really have to keep on time. Um, the roundtable is on the money and liquidity in times of crisis. It's an exciting topic, and I could not dream of a better panel, actually, to discuss this topic. So um, let me arbitrarily, I know what you're going to talk about, but uh, there's a lot of overlap. Let me start with Amy. Thank you very much. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, so uh, I wanted to say a few words about the um, sort of aborted um, financial crisis, uh, generally financial crisis in the context of the, co uh, of the COVID crisis. Um, so to talk about the early signs of financial disruption in the United States during the COVID recession, uh, but also the ways in which government policy and, and um, central bank policy made, it, made it a big difference. So the first reaction you might have when I talk about the idea of financial crisis in the context of the COVID crisis is just the reaction that there was no financial crisis. Um, and, uh, and of course that's true, but it's not clear with the benefit of hindsight that that was the only way things could have gone. Um, because in mid-March, right after the onset um, of COVID, once, you know, once we all found out what was going on, there were some pretty dramatic things that happened in financial markets. So in particular, um, several people have documented that there were these dramatic increases in corporate bond spreads. Uh, corporate bond spreads in the United States rose to their highest levels since the financial crisis. Um, you know, not quite as high as during the financial crisis, but the same ballpark. Um, but what happened after that was very different. Um, so in, in the financial markets, the Federal Reserve in the United States, and of course, central banks around the world, introduced a number of facilities uh, that they had first introduced during the financial crisis. And spreads fell very dramatically over the following months. And by late summer, they were back to fairly normal levels. Um, now, of course, we'll, we'll never know fully what the counterfactual was, uh, but it, it seems very plausible that um, this reaction made a big difference. The labor market um, recovery has also been uh, incredibly unusual. In the United States, unemployment rose to about 15% in the United States, peaking in April, which was, again, uh, truly historic in terms of the rise of the speed of the increase. But we had not only the most rapid increase in unemployment uh, for a long time, but also the most rapid decrease. Uh, and in particular, it was remarkable um, the extent to which uh, the labor market consequences of the, of, of the COVID crisis, even in the United States, where there was less you know, direct support for firms and so on than, than elsewhere, were fairly concentrated in the sectors of the economy that were directly affected by the COVID crisis, like, for example, you know, the airline industry and so on. Um, and the last thing I wanted to mention that has been very unusual uh, during the, this COVID recession has been what has been happening with savings, um, which have literally been off the charts. Um, if you've been using the axes appropriate for previous uh, events, um, so the personal savings rate, for example, rose roughly to 34% in April from levels in the ballpark of five to 10% uh, throughout the 2000s, and this led to a completely unprecedented buildup of personal savings during the recession. Nothing like this has, has happened in any uh, post-war um, recession in the United States. Now, of course, I, I don't want to say that all of this, uh, these differences had you know, had to do with policy. There's no doubt that uh, a big part of the difference had to do with the, the original source of the, of, of, of the crisis. You know, the COVID shock was so different from other economic shocks. It didn't look like either really a demand shock or a supply shock because there was also this big element of rationing where people were not, were, were literally not allowed to buy or, or were, you know, it wasn't in the social interest to have people buying the things that they wanted to buy. And that was obviously part of what was going on with savings. But still, I think it is worth remarking on the incredible speed and, and force of the policy response to the COVID crisis, um, not only the speed and, and force of the monetary response, which I think no doubt was drawing on what a lot of what was learned um, in, in the financial crisis, uh, but also the speed and force of the fiscal response um, to, to the COVID crisis. And, and my guess is um, that, um, you know, we'll never know the counterfactual, but my, my, I think it's very plausible that these government policies made a huge difference in cushioning the blow. And my sense is 
that um, you know this is something that makes sense to talk about exactly this forum because um, it's a case where my guess is many of these policies would not have been possible without all of the research that occurred uh, in central banks associated with the financial crisis. You can see a very direct link uh, between many of the policies that were enacted during the COVID crisis and, and those that came before. So let me, let me uh, stop there. Well, thank you so much, Amy. Uh, let me turn to John, and I don't know if you are going to continue with the dark side of quantitative easing, but uh, Amy, talk about savings, you may talk about investment. Indeed, uh, I won't uh, take my full time because I may have spent too much time on my own talk. Um, yes, the dark side of quantitative easing. Quantitative easing is obviously aimed at flattening the yield curve, particularly in contexts where the short term rates may be hitting the zero lower bound. Now, may, may I take you back to my the little model I've just shown you? Imagine that. The, the yield curve flattens, but short-term interest rates do not drop because, let's say, zero lower bound. Well, now the what I call B, which is the amount that Sam is willing to pay Emma for the initial project, will not go up that much because B, remember, is the present discounted value of a relatively short horizon sequence of revenues, net revenues after wages, what Sam anticipates receiving. Whereas Q, the price of buildings, which is part of the cost of the investment for Emma, goes up a lot. And that, from Emma's perspective, is pure bad news. She's not being able to borrow much more, but on the other hand, her costs are really shooting up now. So it's, um, dare I suggest that one of the dark sides, potential dark sides of flattening the yield curve is to suppress investment in the way that I've described, but with a twist, and literally a twist in the yield curve. Another, I think, important um, group in society that might be badly affected by this are young households trying to get onto the property ladder in the first place. Why? Because they usually are constrained by their net income. They're again short, run, fairly short run net income. Whereas the, the home that they're trying to buy is dr dramatically rises in value in response to quantitative easing if, it's going to, if the policy is working. So they find themselves in they've got a double bind and unable to get onto the housing ladder. Now you might say, well, it's swings and roundabouts, some winners, some losers, but actually the Amazon of the world and the young people trying to get on the housing ladder are the very people it's in whom society is relying on for medium to long-term growth. So maybe that's a little negative, but I'd like to suggest that there is a, a dark side to quantitative easing. Thank you. Well, thank you, John. Uh, Silvana, you're going to mention the action of the Bank of England. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me in the panel. Um, money and liquidity in times of crisis is obviously a hugely important um, topic. And as advanced economies recover from COVID, it's crucial to look back on central bank policies during the crisis. Now, as Amy said, although there were many unique features to the COVID crisis, there were also many similarities with other crises uh, in many of the monetary policy responses. Uh, ex ante, the role of money and liquidity may seem less clear in response to the COVID shock compared to a crisis that originated in the financial sector. When lockdowns were uh, first imposed, shutting down large parts of the economy, fiscal policy was rightly the main actor and the obvious actor across uh, advanced economies in providing insurance to those most affected. Um, but across countries, there were also large monetary policy responses. In the UK, I will pick out three main ones. Uh, first, we cut interest rate to the lowest uh, levels ever, 0.1%. Second, those cuts were supported by multiple lending schemes, including some jointly with government, to ensure that the cuts were passed through to the cost of credit and that credit remained widely available. 
And third, we stepped up our QE purchases of government bonds using liquid uh, central bank reserves. And I'll come back to John's point uh, in a second. Now, each of these three policies aimed in different ways to use central bank liquid liquidity to support uh, the economy. The first one, cutting rates, was the textbook transmission of monetary policy. Um, we cut policy rates to help mitigate the fall in aggregate demand. The shock was unique. Some sectors were required to fully shut down where the health risks were high, but many other sectors remained open. And we saw clearly over the pandemic that consumers and businesses were able to substitute spending and production significantly. So lowering, lowering policy rates was important to support spending in those other sectors that were able to keep operating during, during the pandemic and, and in a safe way. The other two liquidity channels relate to uh, those that John has highlighted in, in his research with Nobu Kiyotaki, where they differentiate between financial frictions that induce a borrowing constraint, limits on how much debt agents, businesses and, and households can take on, and those that induce a resaleability constraint or limits on the market liquidity of different assets. The UK lending schemes, in particular, were aimed at preventing tighter borrowing constraints, particularly where massive uncertainty had led to increases in perceived credit risk. At the margin, of course, lowering interest rates uh, should also have helped relax the borrowing constraints. For firms with floating rate debt, the cutting rates aim aimed to bolster uh, cash flows, reducing debt servicing costs, as well as a need to increase borrowing to finance additional uh, working capital needs. And turning to the resaleability constraint, the large scale QE asset purchases stepped in where there had been a sharp reduction in market liquidity, with things turning quickly towards market dysfunction, as Amy mentioned, in March 2020. Uh, this period has been dubbed uh, a dash for cash, and some of my colleagues at the Bank of England have uh, produced some excellent summaries uh, of the events that took place. Uh, Jean's work with Emmanuel Fari uh, has also taught us about the microeconomic underpinnings of those liquidity shortages. But at, at the very high level, assets that were previously thought to be perfectly liquid were no longer li liquid enough. And liquidity premium didn't just rise on risky assets, as we saw with mortgage-backed securities back in the financial crisis. Yields spiked even on UK government bonds and US treasuries. So for a, a, a period of time, only cash, the ultimate liquid asset, would do. And given the likelihood that those increases in yields would have fed through to activity in the real economy, the central bank response was to offset that spike in demand for liquidity via a QE asset swap with central bank reserves. Um, so in some sense, I mean, responding to John, QE programs have done, over time have done uh, both, buying a mix of liquid and illiquid uh, assets. During the dash for cash, everything but cash was illiquid. So the main transmission of QE at the time uh, was more of your qualitative easing rather than quantitative easing in, in, in your uh, taxonomy. So to sum up, stre stretching a bit the, the taxonomy, the three policies sought to offset three frictions. First, the new Keynesian friction or nominal friction. R star was falling, so cutting rates helped to stimulate aggregate demand. Second, borrowing frictions, firms going out of businesses or cutting investment or households cutting their, their own spending. And third, market liquidity or resaleability frictions with liquidity premiums spiking on everything that was in cash. All three frictions carried the risk of hysteresis, which would have grabbed drag the effects even longer uh, without the policy interventions. I'll pause here. Well, thanks so much, Silvana. Uh, Jan, you are going to go back both to the financial crisis and also to your previous talk. I'll give you a couple more minutes. Thank you, and uh, sorry about the technical glitches on our side. So let me just, to wrap up what I was saying before, uh, the main point that I was trying to make w was that 
uh, when you're trying to estimate the slope of the Phillips curve using aggregate variation, you face this incredibly difficult empirical problem, uh, which has to do with uh, time variation in the monetary regime. And, you know, the monetary regime has shifted quite a bit over the samples we use. And so the point of this more recent literature that we've contributed to has been, uh, or one of the, one of the upsides of, of that literature has been that when you compare one region relative to another within a monetary union, you can difference out the monetary regime. And that helps you very much in estimating the slope of the Phillips curve. And so arguably you can get more credible slopes of the Phillips curves. And, and when we do that, we estimate a relatively modest slope of the Phillips curve. Uh, people differ a little bit in, in how they interpret our slope. Some people say it's healthy, some people say it's small. Uh, that depends a little bit on where you sit. But in terms of if, if people are worried about very substantial movements in inflation, we would like to argue that the debate should not really be about the slope of the Phillips curve. It should really be about longer run inflationary expectations. And so when we worry about big increases in inflation, we worry about central banks losing the anchoring of longer run inflationary expectations. This is, then leads you to think more about things like fiscal dominance and so on. But uh, to turn to the topic of the panel um, on money, liquidity in a time of crisis, um, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to spend a few minutes thinking about the value of theory when it comes to monetary policy in a crisis. Um, and I want to, you know, in particular, discuss the response of the Federal Reserve uh, to the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. Uh, one of the important aspects of the response of the Federal Reserve to that crisis was a very substantial amount of lender of last resort lending and then asset purchases, which usually go under the uh, heading of quantitative easing. Now, these policies at the time were extremely controversial for many reasons. But one of those reasons was that a lot of commentators uh, were worried that these quantitative easing policies would lead to a, a substantial burst in inflation. Um, now, why would that be? Why would you be worried about that? Well, uh, these quantitative easing policies, they did need, lead to a truly enormous increase in the monetary base. So the monetary base in the United States rose from 800 billion to 1.6 trillion, so it doubled in the course of one year and then continue to rise after that. And so, you know, if you have a cursory understanding of monetary economics, you might say, oh, you double the money supply, obviously there's going to be a lot of inflation. Um, isn't that what we teach in our classes? Well, interestingly enough, monetary economists were not worried about a lot of inflation in response to this policy. And the reason for that is that this uh, logic that I just gave you, even though it is superficially a very compelling argument, actually is flawed. And, and that's because um, at the time, interest rates were very close to zero, and the Fed had started paying interest on reserves. And paying interest on reserves really fundamentally changes the nature of bank reserves. And you know, once you understand that, then you realize that banks are happy to hold a very substantial amount of excess reserves, and these, the, the very large increase in the monetary base does not translate into huge increases in uh, the money supply held by the public, like M1 and M2, and so on. And the whole logic that you may have been taught in your intermediate macro class doesn't follow. Now, you know, somebody that has a bit more than a cursory understanding of monetary theory would understand this. And, and monetary economists, they differed very substantially from other commentators during this episode in that they were not worried about inflation. And we were lucky at the time that the people running the Federal Reserve, remember these policies were very radical, they were very large. And we were lucky that at the time the people that were running the Federal Reserve had more than a cursory understanding of monetary theory. And, you know, because you know, you, there was no history to go by in terms of thinking about the consequences of these policies. You had to rely on your theoretical understanding of what the consequences of what you were doing were, were going to be. And these people, they, they had a good understanding of this and therefore did these policies without being worried about something that turned out to be 
not important. Now, fast forward to this, the crisis that Silvana and Emmy were talking about, the COVID crisis. Again, the Federal Reserve engaged in very substantial quantitative easing. And this time around, at least this particular worry was not very prominent. And that was because, you know, the intellectual war had been won on this point. It obviously turned out to be the case that doubling the money supply in this particular way does not lead to a lot of inflation. So I, I think that I always use that as an example of the value of theory when I teach uh, monetary economics to my students. Okay, well, thanks so much, John. Um, let me just uh, first, that was great, and you kept on time, and it was very interesting. So um, I know the governor has a lot of constraints, so I think it would be fair to ask him uh, to ask the first question. Uh, Jean, let me first thank uh, Silvana, Amy, and John, and Professor Mu, obviously, for all the insights, because it, it brought ma many things. Uh, but perhaps one reflection and then one question. Uh, as Amy said, it's obviously an unprecedented crisis uh, and an unprecedented monetary answer. So what did we learn beyond the COVID crisis for the future? It's probably too early to tell. Uh, but uh, if I had to elaborate a first answer about what we learned, uh, we learned probably that central banks are never out of ammunition. And remember w what was the atmosphere before the COVID crisis. Conventional wisdom said on both sides of the Atlantic, due to the low level of interest rates, that central banks would be short of ammunition in case of a new crisis. We had the worst crisis ever, and we were able to react. Due to the fact, and this is the focus of this round table, that liquidity provision is probably extremely important. And we rediscovered, so to say, the importance of liquidity provision. If I may illustrate it in the case of the ECB, everybody speaks about QE. I'm not sure I agree with Professor Mu about the dark side of QE, but it will be for another time when you come to Paris. Uh, but we never speak, or almost never speak, about TLTRO which is a very important program in our case, still more important if you look at its volume. And we introduced a subsidy element in liquidity provision, which is very innovative. So we are not at the end of this reflection. Uh, and third, what Silvana mentioned, probably what was very efficient in this crisis was the monetary slash fiscal mix. And both of them were aligned, are very powerful. And sometimes we said in the governing council, I don't say it publicly, that fiscal policy is now the main transmission channel of monetary policy. Uh, if you look for advanced economy, it's obvious. And this was very unexpected. If I had one question, John, about what you said about monetary base increasing and no inflation, and you gave very eloquently the reason for that. Everybody who understands monetary policy can understand why this time is different. But I just said everybody who understands monetary policy. If I look at public opinion, and I guess it's not very different on both sides of the Atlantic or on both sides of the, ch of the channel, more than 95% of our fellow citizens at least don't understand monetary policy, including in my own family. I don't know how it is for your two children, Amy and John, but uh, I can imagine they are very well educated, but it's really a challenge. And this is important for us, because there is a fear. Uh, and it's a very uh, frequently asked question, saying, so you create money. We can understand that it's your freedom as central banks. But how can you promise to us that you are not creating inflation. And uh, if you speak to non-specialist, I think that it's very important that we can explain that this former traditional link between monetary base or monetary aggregates as a whole and inflation, which was the core of the simplified monetary theory, to put it in a nutshell, is no longer relevant. Uh, and 
so I, I would put the question to you, how would you explain it, uh, how, how would you suggest to central bankers to uh, explain it to our fellow citizens and hence to consolidate trust? Who wants to answer? Yeah, well, could I um, perhaps get off my chest the thing I would have liked to have said in my little in interjection, the other thing, which is that I see, I think we all see a very important distinction between, as it were, working off the liquidity premium on the one hand and working off the term premium on the other hand. And in my remarks and the dark side of quantitative easing, I had in mind the quantitative easing in the purest form that the central bank buys long-term government bonds, which are as liquid, roughly speaking, as money itself. In other words, the classic, as I see it, the classic form of quantitative easing is working off the term premium. Now, the whole business of providing liquidity in the form of trying to prop up markets that have gone illiquid, I'm all for that. But I, of course one is. Look what has been, well, look what's been achieved in the last 15 years. But I'd like to sort of, if nothing else for debating purposes, separate that from quantitative easing. So my remarks about quantitative easing were about that. In reply, just my my question to um, Emmy and John is, and the governor, is maybe Emmy and John's children are right, at least somewhat. So I take your point, uh, Governor, that uh, the public need to be educated, but I still think the, public, the public's intuition may be maybe not so bad, and we may be in for a dose of inflation. Anyway, I, I, forgive me interrupting. So John and Emmy. Emmy. Uh, so let me first say that I, um, I can very much relate to what you're saying about the challenges of communication. I, I taught MBAs for some time, and I was often struck by the fact that even just the word inflation was not really understood by the typical MBA student. Um, and the typical MBA student is a pretty educated person. So I think that experience really changed how I thought about the issue of communication. Now, I would emphasize that there was a very big difference between the American MBA students and the, and the ones from Latin America. The Latin American MBA students all understood what, um, what inflation meant. Um, and so I think, you know, part of the, the confusion that we see today is also, of course, related to the fact that, you know, monetary economics isn't hasn't been very important um, to the everyday lives of most people, mostly because, because central banks have been so successful. And I guess that comes to where I don't have a full answer to you, but let me just say that I think the success of central banks in controlling inflation over the past uh, several decades is, is, is just incredibly impressive. And I think sometimes they don't get enough credit for this because, of course, there are multiple objectives and it's not like the business cycle has totally been eliminated, but it is pretty remarkable, I often think, when the Fed is getting criticized for hitting inflation of 1.5% instead of 2%. And I say to myself, that's pretty fine tuning for um, most economic policy when we're into the decimal places and so on. So I guess on communication, I would say that while I agree with you that at least given the fact that most people don't encounter economics in education until uh, university, they don't see it in high school, for example, it's very difficult to uh, explain all the ins and outs of everything. There is uh, a set of results um, of what has been achieved over, uh, by now, a pretty long period of time that I think the central bank can make reference to in kind of making the case to, you know, a less uh, informed observer that they actually have control over the units. You know, and at the end of the day, it's all about the units, you know, and in some sense it is maybe in some abstract sense plausible that the central bank sense, you know, they print the money that they could control the units and make make the unit stable. Um, but I guess that, so I, I, I have two thoughts. One is that um, the history is 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 impressive. And, and I think um, drawing on the history and trying to make the case to the public makes sense. And we're in a very different situation today than we were like in the United States in the early 1980s when there just wasn't that history to draw on. Um, and, um, and so I think that's, you know, one, one, one direction. Um, to emphasize. And the other is just the commitment to this, 
to, to, this, to the institution, the stability of the institution, which I think you know was core to, to, to making that, that, that history um, come to pass. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Silvana, you raise your hand. Yeah, I'll just uh, as one of Latin America, the Latin Americans in, uh, in the example. Um, growing up in Argentina, of course, everyone knows what inflation is. I mean, since you're a little child, you would run to the shop as, you, as soon as you get a bill in your hands. I mean, that's the training. So everybody really knows. And as Amy says, it's a sign of success of central banks and advanced economies to, to a large extent that people are not worried about that constant source of stress for people in many Latin American countries, definitely Argentina, um, Venezuela uh, right now, um, where you really have to stress on, on a daily basis about uh, about inflation. On communications of QE is so tough to explain. I mean, I think in, in some sense the easiest way to explain the distinction between cutting rates and doing QEs at rates, um, cutting rates is uh, operates on, on the short end and QE affects um, yields in, in the longer term or rates in the longer term and sometimes people can can understand those concepts uh, a little better uh, but this brings me back to something that john was saying but in some sense uh you know the falling interest rates is not qe john as as you know it it's it's a real phenomenon and there are many factors there and before you, you uh, cited Japan, I mean, there's demographics, there's productivity growth, um, there's tail risks that are valued differently. And, and so all these factors have made this secular rate fall. And then QE is operating on that very tiny margin, okay? How much can the central bank lower yields relative to those R stars? And, you know, that's, that's the margin of action for us in, in terms of stimulating the economy. Um, but yeah, and I agree, fully agree with you that in episodes of market disruption, that's when you have a full power because you, you can really um, um, act on those liquidity um, uh, spikes, spike up in, in liquidity risk. Thanks. Well, thank you. Uh, François and Olivier, do you have any other question? I know we have to finish in three or four minutes so that... Uh... Okay, can I only add one sentence from a policymaker's standpoint, John? Yes, please. Yes, no, uh, just to say that the more innovative and sophisticated we are in our tools, and we must be innovative and sophisticated, the more open-minded and simple we must be in our communication to the broad public. And this is an interesting challenge on both sides. Uh, and you feel, as I do feel, that there are growing questions from our fellow citizens uh, about our monetary power. And they speak sometimes of miracle, but this, this word is a bit ambivalent. Huh? Uh, and so we have this double challenge of digging always into more sophisticated and innovative territory, uh, but keeping a close eye on the broad public uh, and, and trying to explain more and more sophisticated things in a more and more simple wording. But this is, it belongs to the charm of the job, if I may say it so. so. Okay. Um. We all have lots of questions, I certainly do, but I think it's time to call it a day. Uh, let me thank once again uh, the governor and Olivier for, for that time and for being here. I would like to thank also the staff of uh, the Bank of France and TSC for organizing this event. And I would like to congratulate once again the laureates. I mean, they have uh, proved you know, how great they are, how great economies they are. And that was not easy, but uh, still we had wonderful talks. Um, you're really transforming the field, so that's very nice. And thanks for accepting the prize. Um, we look forward to seeing you in, uh, in Paris and in Toulouse as well. You're, of course, welcome to both places. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you soon, hopefully. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Uh, thank you.